So as Anthony said, my name is Ryan Woods. Uh, I'm an aquarist, a mystic aquarium. I'm currently the coral aquarist, which is fitting for our environment today and where we all are. I'm tethered to this desk and this keyboard. I don't have a clicker, but um, we might be walking around. So I heard you want a big tank. This presentation, if you can't tell already, is going to be pretty informal. It's kind of more of just a talk. Uh, if people have questions, I hope to leave about 25 minutes or so of the hour for a Q&A session. So if anyone wants to, to have any, any questions about anything really, myself, the institution, anything you see in the presentation, that'll be the time for it. So fire away at the end, but just keep those questions. The title is not supposed to kind of lead you to believe that you shouldn't want a big tank. Uh, that's not the intent. I'm trying to just contrast and compare a large system and a small system. I feel like I'm in a, a somewhat interesting kind of position. I'm a hobbyist outside of my day to day, but then I also take care of some relatively large mixed reef systems at the aquarium. And the difference between those two worlds, if you will, is, is pretty drastic. And that's part of the, the point of this presentation. And then also just show hands who has been, and no guilt, who has been to Mystic Aquarium in the last four years? Yeah, pretty good, thanks. So about the last four years or so, um, some of the current volunteers in my department are laughing. Um, but um, in the last four years or so, Mystic's put about $5 million into the actual uh, fish tank part of the aquarium, not necessarily the whales or the penguins, but the actual inside part with all of the reef tanks. And currently, right now, as I talk to you, we're in the middle of a three quarter of a million dollar uh, renovation of the shark touch tank, which is also a fantastic addition to the main floor. It's a centerpiece, if you will. So. Like my point with this is, for people that haven't been to Mystic in a while, the majority of this presentation is going to be photos, both out front so you can see what the systems actually look like, and then also behind the scenes discussing life support and kind of how systems are plumbed and choices that were made and animals that are in them. So this is a somewhat encompassing presentation of the Coral Gallery at Mystic Aquarium, my role in it, and how that may differ from what people keep at home and the whole point of this type of get together. So without further ado, this first slide is a direct quote from the Mystic Aquarium website of a job description. We just hired two aquarists, and although it's somewhat texty, right in the middle, it says, minor carpentry, plumbing, and painting is desired. Something that I like to point out, I think that reef keeping, uh, for both aspects of the hobby, professional and, and hobbyist, um, it's extremely multidisciplinary. It involves woodworking, building stands, husbandry, flow dynamics, Potentially programming, definitely plumbing, uh, I mean, even physics, chemistry, dosing, all this type of stuff. So I love the fact that Mystic, we as an organization, we actually recognize that so strongly, we put it in writing on our job requirements. And that's something that I still feel hobbyists feel very strongly about. I certainly do for my own tank in my living room. And um, I just wanted to show that that's still, that's still held in high regard. Day to day right into some differences between people's tanks at home and maybe the aquarium. Um, at the aquarium, we, we log everything. So I don't know how many people keep like an Excel spreadsheet for their own tanks at home or, or a paper sheet, but we do at the aquarium every single system, every single day, opening and closing, we monitor everything. And People really value their reef tanks, rightfully so. A lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of money goes into keeping a reef tank. Now imagine that two days a week, someone else takes care of it. Not you. This is a fantastic way to, on paper, log accountability. And part of that is all the way on the left, there's a column with initials. And that's for the staff members. And that's something that we've done forever. We'll continue to do so. We're very, hopefully soon, going to be going to tablets as opposed to printing out paper. So that'll be very nice going into the 21st century. But these check sheets are at every single system. We do opening and closing checks twice a day at a minimum, unless it's like Christmas, which we're still there, uh, but just not the whole day. And um, we log everything that you can possibly think to log, from what we feed to chemistry values to a massive general note section on the back. So if I frag up a huge acro, or I you know, move some stuff around or reprogram the flows on my gyres, I can make a record of that. And then two weeks later, when I bleach like a, a possible floor or something, I can be like, oh, because I directed all the flow right at it. And then I can see how that, you know, that happened. So check sheets, good stuff. Feeds, day to day, animals gotta eat, corals gotta eat, reef tanks are fed usually pretty heavy. That's a very normal part of the day to day. That's just meant to be interpreted literally. Um, people need to feed the reef tanks in their home, people need to feed the tanks at the aquarium. 
A lot of the reef tanks I feed only three days a week. That's not entirely uh, the case for the whole gallery. Garden eels, which you'll see in a minute, they have almost no GI tract, so they're fed three times a day, every day, forever. Uh, but that's because they can't really build that without food. And then maintenance. So we're a publicly um, run aquarium that's open to the public almost 365 days a year. It's like 363 days a year or something. And we need to be, call it appropriate for public display. So maintenance, you might do maintenance on the reef tank at home once a month, every other week. There's a lot of different schedules that people like to keep to. For the aquarium, maintenance is an extremely important part, especially in the coral gallery. While you might not necessarily be doing a water change every week or every day or whatever, maintenance in some aspect, I generally touch every one of the eight systems in the coral gallery every day, five days a week. And again, some of the, we actually have some volunteers from, from the Mystic in the audience, so they can certainly attest. And I sometimes ask not the most fun tasks in the world, but they are definitely important nonetheless. So some quick comparisons, not that those weren't, but similarities. Chemistry. Chemistry is chemistry. It doesn't matter if your system's large or small or SPS dominant or you know, softy or gorgonian or whatever. Chemistry stays chemistry. So if you have a five gallon like Mr. Aqua Pico on your kitchen counter or you have a 20,000 gallon mixed reef system that's been set up for 25 years on Long, Long Island, excuse me, Dosing, balancing calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium, all like the nutrient management and that goes along with it, nitrates and phosphates, it's all the same. There's obviously differences, but the chemistry stays the same. Husbandry, doing something like the example I gave of, of changing flow patterns and then bleaching something, or fragging something, or knowing that you can put this echinophilia near <coughs> this other chalice, but if you were to put this euphelia next to the, you know, this leather, things will kill each other. Or knowing how to frag something appropriately without killing the entire colony and generating those frags successfully. The husbandry doesn't change regardless of the size of your system and regardless of your environment, either professional or as a hobbyist. It's all the same. So if you've successfully fragged a number of different corals outside of the aquarium and then you got hired in an aquarium, none of it changes. Very nice. Attention to detail. That's a really big important thing. Getting eyes on your systems. It's very easy to get lost in your work with your head down. But walking around and looking at your systems from the public perspective, and the back of the house too, but from both, what if something's growing a little bit different uh, in one of your larger mixed reefs and it's cutting off flow, changing the flow to your tank, and all of a sudden some prized acro now is not receiving the flow that it needs and it's starting to get stressed out. If you don't see that, if you're not really paying attention to detail and looking at your stuff, you might not get an opportunity to save that. You know, I'm not talking about an acro frag, I'm talking about a colony. You might not get an opportunity to save that before it's too late. So attention to detail is incredibly important. From the chemistry side of things, just a quick little sidebar, the attention to detail also goes for the check sheets. Those check sheets are the analog log of everything that we do, including chemistry values. So being able to flip through a binder and look at months of chemistry values is fantastic. You can see I dosed this on this day, two days later this changed, and you can kind of look at, at the details of that and judge mistakes or, or changes or volumes based on, on those details. So very, very important. Differences. A couple things here blend very well together, so I might not express it on every bullet point, but size, that's quite literal. So my tank in my living room is 20 gallon. A, a system in your living room, you are the financier of that system. You are the marine biologist of that system. Everything that you do or do not do is your choice. If you want to try something that may be a slight risk, or an experiment, or you want to dose something different, let's say you're having bubble algae, you want to dose Vibrant, which is a product, no problem. Look up some forums, maybe read some articles, get a magazine, and then you've made up your decision, and you begin doing whatever in your system. This blends very nicely with processes. At the aquarium, we are not there to take care of our systems. The coral systems of Mystic are not mine. They are the aquariums. So the way that I like to phrase it is I cannot take risks, period. And that goes very nicely with the not your display. It's the aquarium's animals, it's the aquarium's money. And ultimately, it's everyone's money because we're public. So having that mindset really helps out well in differentiating between doing this at home and doing this at work. 
And I, I take care of you know, eight moral systems all day long for sometimes very long hours. And people ask me, why do you still do this at home? Why do you want to go home and do more water changes and do more of the same work? And I like to laugh and say, it's not the same work. It's different enough for me that I don't have any problem doing it more on a Friday that I worked a 12 hour shift. Um, it's so different in my mindset that it's, it's, not, it's not keeping the same systems. I don't know, it's difficult for me to explain. Hard to put in words. Veterinarian staff. Not a lot of hobbyists have access to a veterinarian staff. Um, I don't know if who here's ever done a necropsy on something like a purple tank, or who's ever tried to send out like um, histo on like brown jelly slime that took down a fossil pora. We have a full-time vet staff at Mystic. Usually we have three vets on campus at all times unless something's going on, maybe we'll only have one or two, and they're, they're real full-blown veterinarians. We'll also usually have a vet in, like intern or extern depending on the year, and then usually a vet tech. So we could have up to five basically veterinarians at all times. The vet staff is an extremely integral part of both the Coral Gallery and also Mystic's operations as a whole. The Coral Gallery, the focus is coral, they're keeping the coral, they're more sensitive usually than the, than the bony fish, the teleosts, but there's still fish. So the vet staff, we work with incredibly closely. If anyone is showing, you know, let's say a, a tank starts showing signs of HLLE and we, we really can't remove the carbon from the system or we can't up the nutrients in some way, uh, the vet staff will be brought in. If we need to do something, this is not the coral gallery, but if we need to do annual physicals on all of our six to eight foot sand tiger sharks, the vet staff are extremely important, um, let alone all the whales and all that other stuff that I don't deal with. But vet staff, an interesting point with them, um, veterinarians, especially our veterinarians, fantastic, very smart people. They go to a law school. Uh, they definitely know what they're doing. But I don't know a single veterinarian that's been taught coral health in vet school. So, like, people, you know, vets, they, they know a lot about keeping, you know, dogs and, and cats and maybe, like, some cooler vets like iguanas and some other type of stuff. But no, like, Vets won't necessarily know how to try and use a concentrated iodine solution to stop the progress of brown jelly in an SPS colony. So the vet staff, our relationship, or my relationship with them, is a bit different from the rest of the aquarium because sometimes I will be in a position where I'm compiling scholarly literature and suggesting gently, suggesting to the vets that we do something about this. And then they'll review the literature and say, hey, you're right. And then we do it. So it's an interesting relationship with the vet staff. They're fantastic people, though. Water quality lab. We have a dedicated water quality lab. How fantastic is that? I don't test my own water quality, uh, which is sweet. So every week, once a week, for me, it's on Wednesdays for no particular reason. I send out a water sample of every one of the eight systems in the coral gallery. A few hours later, I get results spat back at me, which is fantastic. We're trying to move more towards like ion chromatography, if we can casually get like 60 grand to get that unit, um, which would be very nice for testing trace elements and potassium and other very important things, for corals at least. Uh, but right now, usually we get the temperatures we just do, but we get pH, salinity, uh, ammonia, nitrite, nitrate, alkalinity, calcium, magnesium, phosphates, and I can get strontium and chlorine tested if I have ever wanted to. Uh, so all of those values I can get once a week, which is extremely nice, saves me a ton of time. Um, and it's been a few years since I've used a spectrophotometer, uh, so it's fantastic that we have like real water quality techs that are a lot better at doing that than I am. Very nice. But I don't know how many hobbyists have access to a water quality lab. And then AZA compliance. And most of the people in this room probably, you know, know some of the benefits of LEDs in terms of cost savings on your electricity bill, the programmability, and then the lack of transfer of heat to the actual tank. What's cool with the radions is through the reflank and some of our programming, I can geotag these to different areas uh, of the world and have, actually have this reef mimic different reefs, like for instance,